three Bibles this morning, so we're going to get it right. Galatians chapter 2 in the 16th verse says, Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. The law cannot justify us. Sometimes, though we get so used to rules and regulations that the idea of living without some kind of a religious restriction scares us. I was at that place at one time in my life of where <coughs> I, I thought that if you taught too much grace, then you were presenting a slippery slope and everybody would go sliding down and, and we'd all end up in uh, who knows where, you know? I, uh, and now I understand, of course, that that's a lie from the pit. In the movie of the Shawshank Redemption, Red told Andy this. He said, these walls are funny. First you hate them. Then you get used to them. Enough time passes, you get so that you depend on them. That's being institutionalized. That's how it is with the law. We get so that we need them. It's called religion. When we base our lives upon the law and our own rules and regulations, it's religion. The word religion likely comes from the Latin word which means to, to bind. Now, if you want to put a positive spin on that, then you can say, well, you know what? We have a Christian religion, and so consequently, now we're bound to God. Okay, we, we have the law, we're bound to God. That's not true. Only one thing can bind us to God, and that's the power of God's Holy Spirit. The law cannot do that. And so it's the Lord Jesus Christ who has to work in our lives. Religion only binds to rules and never-ending demand to perform better. The good news is in Romans chapter 7, Romans chapter 7, verse 6, it says, But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit, and not in the old way of the written code. See, but our problem is, is that we still get religious in all of this. We get this idea that if we're going to serve in the Spirit, then somehow there's got to be something really mystical that tied to it. We're all going to clasp hands and walk through Safeway singing hallelujah or whatever the case may be. I don't know what it's supposed to be. I, I don't understand how we, we ended up at a place of where we just can't say, you know what, Jesus lives in me and I'm a happy little camper. Right? What, what, why, why, why do we try to look for something that's supernatural out there when Christ resides in us? If I'm a Christian and you're a Christian, we have to believe that every day, day after day, 7, 24, 365, and 66 every fourth year, it, Jesus is within me, he leads me and guides me in all truth and righteousness, and at the end I'll be where he wants me to be. Right? Not, I'm not on this journey alone. Jesus is taking us. When we all used to get together and sing, he holds the whole world in his hand. Those of us who are old enough will remember that. It's true. He does. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus holds the whole world in his hand. We get into some sort of problem, though, and the first thing that we do is we go and seek counsel. And I'm not against counselors. I've had counsel. I've given counsel. Some of it not the best. Still, you know, the question that we all want is, tell me what to do. I'm in this place and I don't know what to do. And, 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 and then we get this feeling that something's wrong in our life. And so what we do is we get out our little mental checklist and say, still praying, check, still singing, check, beat the wife, oh, maybe not. Okay? 
we find what we think is wrong and then we say, oh, forgive us, Lord, forgive us. That's law, people. If we're getting out some kind of mental checklist in order to see where we're going wrong with Jesus, then we don't have a relationship with Jesus. I'll tell you what, I've got a relationship with my wife and if I start to do something wrong, I soon know. Do we not think that Jesus is stronger than my wife? Absolutely. The reason that we do this, though, is because, you see, we, we, we live in a world of where we can fix things. We have a step-by-step -step progression. My car breaks down. I take it to the garage. The garage determines what's wrong with it. The garage goes and make, takes the steps to replace the parts. Whatever I need, gives me my bill. I go home, cry. It's a step-by-step -step progression, and it's true of all of life. We start school, grade one, kindergarten. We work our way through to however far we go, and as we move along through life, we fix things. We do things. We get into a place of where everything has to be in order, and the order can't change, or otherwise it doesn't work. And then we fail. We try to bring that into our Christian walk. Christianity is not a step-by-step -step institution. Christianity is a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not something of which we can do, a problem that can be fixed by doing the right things. Our walk with Jesus is, <clears throat> has to sit has no set hard and fast rules. That's part of the problem of which we have. We, we, we don't know what the rules are. So we get the rules and we say, this is the way that Christianity should be. Now, I want you all to think about when you got married or when you had children, when you developed a relationship with this young man or this young woman, whatever the case may be. Did you go down to the local license bureau and get a book? that said, this is how you perform in your marriage. One book will cover it all, one law will cover it all, all you have to do is say yes, dear. Do you understand what I'm saying? When the kids come, did they give you a little rule book that said, this is how you raise them, this is how you take care of them? Why do we think that our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ is any different than our marriage or raising children or whatever the case may be? We have this Bible, but this Bible is not given to us in order to follow rules and regulations. This Bible is given to us to show us the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's a relationship between me and my Lord, and it's a relationship between me and all of you, and you with Jesus. It's not following steadfast laws and rules and all the rest of it. We can't do it. We can't, we, we can't handle it. But when we do have a problem, okay, is that well, the problem is, is that we slip back into the law because that's we, where we think we'll find security. But that's not true. Paul... The Apostle Paul was raised in a religion of laws. He believed that he was right with God. He writes and tells us that he was a Pharisee of Pharisee. He was on his way to the top. I was the one, all the rest of them, if you want, were envious of me. I was the one who was going to make it. And then a funny thing happened to him. He had a little encounter with Jesus. And so then in, in, in Romans chapter 10, 7, verse 10, he tells us that the very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. We, we can't keep those commandments. God knew that when he gave them to us. The commandments were given to us in order to fence in sin and show us how we sin and why we sin. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ was given unto us so that we can walk sin free because we belong to Jesus and he paid the price. Okay. Huh. I don't know why I'm going to share this, but I am. 
Do you all remember the story of, of Jesus was saying that that the thief crawls over the fence to, and, and he's not the rightful heir, but the one who enters into the sheepfold and, and, and the sheep is there legally? Okay. We, we look at that, we look at the sheep, we look at all the rest of it, but the concept of it is, in my mind, is this, is that Jesus entering into the sheepfold legally is this. That Jesus was born of a woman and each and every one of us enter the world in the same fashion. The enemy snuck in and climbed over the fence. Jesus is rightful in this world because he belongs in this world. He's part of the sheepfold. He's in the sheepfold while the enemy that come to steal and kill and destroy is not a true part of this world. That's important for us to remember in the fact that indeed God became a man so that we may have this life and have it abundantly in him. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to Paul. There's a lot of rules a person can follow and experience. Uh, we don't just the problem is that we don't just try to follow the laws and the rules and the regulations of the Old Testament law when we're under the law. We put more on ourselves. We, we keep adding the weight. Oh, you know what? I want to do this and then, then I'll be good, but if I just do a little bit more, if I just struggle a little harder, if I just give a little more money, if I pray a little more, if I, if I can do all of these things, then God will be pleased with me. And we do it to ourselves because we don't understand that the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Galatians chapter 3, <coughs> excuse me, please. <clears throat> In the 21st and 22nd verses, it tells us is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. The laws do belong to God. The laws will last forever. They will never disappear. For if a law was given that could give life, the righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ Jesus might be given to those who believe. Sin the law was given to us so we could see what sin was. Our problem with the law is, is that when we see do not touch, what do we do? We touch. Right? Don't do that. You ever tell one of your kids, don't do that? <sighs> Good luck. I did so much, don't do that. Sometimes when the dog misbehaved, my mom would go, Derwin! It's important to understand that living under law is more than what is in Scripture. Many of ourselves, we self-impose laws upon ourselves, and they also hold us in bondage. A lifestyle of likes and dislikes, a lifestyle that is obsessed with doing the right thing. We're, and rather than being obsessed with Jesus, we're obsessed with doing what we think is right. Are we really, really obsessed with Jesus or are we obsessed with our religion? The choice is yours. For me, I'm going to go with Jesus. I know there's times that I slip and fall. I know there's times I'm going to fail. I know there's times that things aren't going to be right. But I know because I know because I know as the little song says, Jesus loves me and he loves you. Now, oh, when God put the couple in the garden and he told them not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Adam and Eve had free reign over a whole garden. They had one law. Think about that. One law. Don't eat of this tree. They could do whatever they wanted. Just don't eat of that tree. One of the things of which, because we, we get this idea that there's a, the tree of life was planted with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we don't stop and think, 
they could partake of the tree of life. It was in the garden they could eat of every tree that includes the tree of life, except for the knowledge of good and evil. They had free reign. The tree of knowledge of good and evil could be called the law tree. The moment they ate of it, they were in a place where doing right and avoiding wrong become the preeminent issue of their life. The moment that they ate of that tree, they said, ah, we're naked. Ah, I'm so ashamed. Ah, let's hide behind that tree. God won't find us. Good luck. Think about it, you know. But they become what? Rather, your eyes went off of God and it went on themselves and their problems and the predicament of which they were in and they forgot to look to God. And that's what law does to each and every one of us. It causes us to take our eyes off of the Lord and onto ourselves. The doing of right and wrong. Before this, all Adam... All of Adam's life could always be glorifying to God because he walked with God daily and God was his source of life. Daily he walked with God. Now his focus was on himself and his behavior and not God. This is the template for every religion in the world including far too much of the Christian religion. Every religion in the world is based upon the fact if I do good or do right or do wrong or whatever the case may be. I won't eat this, I will do that, I'll do this, I won't do that. And far too many of us in the Christian faith follow the same set of rules. Christianity is the only, I hate to use the word now, religion of where we have freedom in Jesus Christ. We don't have to do it. Jesus did it all. There's nothing that we can add to it. It doesn't say anywhere except Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior by faith and stir in a little bit of works. Nowhere. You can't show that to me. That's not there. Often there's that sin, as Adam and Eve sin, is, is that we're on, set on doing the right thing. Through the cross, we have been restored to the place that Adam forfeited. You and I, whether we realize it or not, by the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, we walk with God daily. It's not some supernatural thing of where we've got to feel really good in our tummies or whatever the case may be. It is a thing of faith. I'm going. God's coming with me. Because we... I, dwells within me. And there are places in this world that if we never went there, God would never be there either in the sense of which we take him. Through the cross, we've been restored to the place that Adam forfeited. Therefore, the criteria for our lives returns to God's original design. What was God's original design? Adam and Eve made totally in the image of God and walking with God and being with God every day in a spiritual walk with God. Every day. Living in total dependence on Him. In Christ, our innocence before God has been reestablished. I want you to think about that. Your innocence has been reestablished. I want you to get a picture. Here comes, uh, 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 like in Job, here comes Satan before God says, <clears throat> you considered Derwin? God says, yeah. Well, you know what? If I, you just set me loose, he'd curse you. It's the same kind of thing. And God said, no, 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 no. no. Here's the difference. When they spoke of Job, he said, there is none righteous in the land like Job. Right before God. The difference between Job and I is innocence. No, you can't test him. Why not? He's innocent. Hasn't done anything. He's innocent. You're innocent. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans. 
We have been pronounced innocent. Let me give you an illustration. Here's Adam, sound asleep. Eve thinks, you know what, I'm going to surprise Adam. So she goes, she cooks up a mess of ham and eggs. No, probably not ham. This was before the law. She made this ham and eggs. Big slab of toast, pan fries. She takes it in, Adam's sleeping there, and she waves the plate under his nose because she loves him. And he suddenly wakes up and hits the plate and says, what are you doing, Wakon? What's the matter with you? Why are you waving a piece of toast under my nose? What's the matter with you? You crazy woman? She runs out crying. So Adam, about noon, finally, that's usually how long it takes men, realizes he was wrong. She wanted to do something nice for him. So Adam goes hunting around and finds her. And of course, we've all said this. Eve, I'm sorry. You were right. I was wrong. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. In order to make it up to you, dear, tomorrow's going to be Eve Day. I mean, all of the universe, I want to proclaim to you right now, tomorrow's Eve Day, and she's going to be loved like she's never been loved before. Tomorrow's Eve Day. Next day, true to his word, Adam gets up, he makes breakfast, he wines and dines her, he loves her all day, and everything's just great. That night when they laid down, she said, oh, Adam, I'm so lucky to have a husband like you. You just love me so much. Oh, I'm so blessed. Now, two questions. Was God pleased with the man on the first day? Was God pleased with the man on the second day? The answer is no to both days. Because the second day was works. Okay. God is not pleased on either day. We too often fail to recognize that the tree's name is the knowledge of good and evil. It's not the tree of evil, it is good and evil. In other words, it is possible, possible for us to be doing things that are good and still sinning. Depends on our motives, depends on our hearts, it depends where we're at with the Lord Jesus Christ. The knowledge of good and evil, it is the source of good as well as evil. Even though the man's behavior changed from one day to the next, he was still up the wrong tree. When religion governs your life, your focus is uh, on, behavior, on improving your behavior. That's what religion does. It causes us to want to improve on our behavior. Now, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that. You understand that we should be getting better and better and more Christ-like. But if we're doing it within ourselves instead of relying on the Holy Spirit to change us and cause us to want to be changed, then we're doing it, and that's religion. We have to learn to give it to Jesus and leave it there and let him work in our lives. But there's a little problem with this. We've got to have the intestinal fortitude to let him do it. Far too often we take it to Jesus and we say, ah, you know what, I'll take that one back. I, 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 I can't do this right now. If we just trust God, 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 like I said before, we have this little checklist, I think so does God. And God has this little checklist and says, well, this is what Derwin needs now. And he goes down to 34 and he checks it and that's where I am. And maybe the other 33 aren't that important to God. He changes each and every one of us according to his will. And so consequently, I'm in a place where you aren't and you're in a place where I'm not, but we're all in Jesus Christ. Each and every one of our walks has to be individual and yet corporate. Individual in the fact that we allow Jesus Christ to work in each and every one of our lives and at the same time we belong to the same body of the Lord Jesus Christ of which enables us to love and care and nurture for one another and understand that God is doing a work in all of us. 
and not judge and not talk about it or any of the rest of it. Our job is to love irregardless of where you are and what you're doing. It's not up to me to question it. It is my job to love you and let Jesus do his work in each and every one of your lives. John 10, 10, it says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I, I being Jesus, come that you may have life and have it abundantly. Let's not confuse this with, with physical possessions. Let's, let's understand that this abundance is in Christ and with one another. We need to understand that we're here to love. We're here to nurture. We're here to help others grow. There are many believers and unbelievers who have exemplary behavior, but yet they're miserable. I do all the right things, and yet I feel really crappy. Joy does not come by doing the right thing. Joy comes from God. And I'm not talking about happiness. Let's not confuse happiness and joy because I can be joyful and be upset. And so can you. Joy is that power of the Lord Jesus Christ to understand that I am not alone. It's love, not laws, that God wants to guide us in and how we live our lives in relationship with him and with others first. Even if you act good, as I said, your actions may still be sin. Only when Jesus animates your life does it become of any real value. When we live in dependence of the Lord Jesus Christ, in his indwelling life, we walk in faith and glorify God. Sometimes, do, do we really mean what we say sometimes? We say, oh, well, you know what? I'm not really worried about this. God will take care of it. And sometimes we say it a little bit flippantly and we've all said it. But yet in the end, it does work out and God does take care of it. There's so many things in my life that I can know where, where God took care of it. Hebrews 11, chapter 6 says that without faith, it's impossible to please him. We have to have faith. That's it. We walk in faith. Do you really believe in God? Yes. Do you really believe that will come to happen? Yes. How do you know? God said it. Pretty well settles the question, doesn't it? Remember them, that little fridge magnet we all used to have since God said it, I believe it? Mm, how did that go? God, that settles it. There you go. God said it, I believe it. That settles it. Well, I was looking at that fridge magnet once and, and I thought... Well, that's not right. God said it. Whether I believe it or not, he still said it. Whether I believe, no matter what, God says it, that's the way it is. And what did he say? He said to each and every one of us, you are my beloved. You are my people. You are the people of my pasture. These are the things of which we have to believe about God. We don't have to believe that we're sinners. We have to believe who we are in Jesus Christ. I am a blood-bought child. You are blood-bought children of whom walk in the fullness of God's Holy Spirit daily. That's the confession we need. Not the laws and the rules and the regulations. We need Jesus Christ. The Bible clearly states that we have died to the law. Well, if we've really, really died to the law, why do so many people still try to keep them? Now, Colossians chapter 2, verses 18 to 23. And what I'm going to do is, is that I'm using my three Bibles. I'm going to boil this down. Okay? or in our modern vernacular, I'm going to dumb it down. You ready? Okay. From the book. I won't tell you what, 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 what Bibles I'm using here, but most of you will recognize them. 
uh, 2, chapter 2, verses 18. Where are we here? Okay. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of the angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grow with the growth that is from God. If with Christ you died to the elementary spirits of the world, why is it that you, still, that you are still alive in the world? Do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to those things that perish as they are used according to human precepts and teachings. These are indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity of the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. That is a mouthful. So, <clears throat> same verse. By the time we get through all three, you guys are going to have this memorized. Okay. 2, 18 to 23. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you from the prize. Such a person goes in great detail about what he has seen and his unspiritual mind puffs him up with idle notions. He has lost connections with the head, the head being Christ, from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grow as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the basic principles of this world, why, as though you still belong to it, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These are all destined to perish with use because they are based on the human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have the appearance of wisdom, but they are self-imposed worship. They are false humility and harsh treatment of the body and they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. My favorite. You all will get this now. Ready? Don't tolerate people who try to run your life. Offering you, ordering you to bow and scrape and insisting that you join their obsession with angels and that you seek out visions. There are a lot of hot air. That's what they are. They're completely out of touch with the source of life, Christ, who puts us together in one piece, whose very breath and blood flows through us. He is the head and we are the body. We can grow up healthily in God only as he nourishes us. So then, if with Christ you've put out, put all the pretense and in fatal religion behind you, then why let someone bully you by it? Don't touch this. Don't taste that. Don't go near this. Do you think these things are here today and gone tomorrow are worth that kind of attention? Such things sound impressive if you say it in a deep enough voice. They even give the illusion of being pious and humble and aesthetic, but they're just another way of showing off and making yourself look important. Trying to bring people under the law and trying to teach people to live by the law does nothing but puff us up and make ourselves look important. That's all it does. When you tell people, oh, don't touch this and don't do that, What's happening is, is that I'm taking authority over their life. And I don't have any right to do that. Only God has the authority over their life. And yet, we have so many who try to do these things. And the Bible tells us plainly, don't. Don't do that. Trust God. Let him do it. It's not our role to tell others how they're supposed to live. It's our role to love, to care, and to nurture. If we truly, truly want to walk in the, the love and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, maybe we do have to do some self-imposing. As I said at the very beginning when I was sharing, I bought a new 
harness for my horses. And because I'm driving them, then the cutter or the wagon, depending on what I'm driving, makes a lot of noise and bounces around. And if they don't have blinkers on their, life, on their eyes, then they get nervous and scared of those noises and those types of things, okay? So you, you cause them, because a horse's vision is, is round almost, not quite 100%. They can't see here down, and, and they can't see right behind them. But they can see back to their hip. So here's this big, scary thing following them. Okay? Now, maybe as Christians, what we need is to get one of those bridles so that we're like this, so that we see what's in front of us and see what our life is about and what's ahead of us rather than worrying about what's beside me or what's behind me. Oh, there's big, scary things beside me or behind me. Did you see what those people were doing? <gasps> There's Billy, just come out of the bar. Quick, quick, run to the church, tell everybody. Spread the good news. Bill was in the bar. Come on. I got saved in a very small town. I'll tell you what, the day I got saved, the guys in the bar knew before I got home. If I can leave you with one thing out of all of this, is love. The Lord Jesus Christ loves you more than you can even imagine. His love knows no depth, it knows no bounds. He holds us, he nurtures us, and cares for us. And there is none other like him. Heavenly Father, we thank you, we worship you. Father God, I your great and magnificent love for each and every one of us humbles us and causes us to understand that we can't do it on our own. It's not through law. It's not through might. It's by your love, Father God, that we'll conquer this world for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you for that, Lord. And I thank you for this time of fellowship, your love for each and every one of us, and the love of which you've given us for each other. In Jesus' name.